Dr. Vern Barron is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada based out of Lacombe, Alberta. Uh, you should be able to see the Murray Abel farm and um, <clears throat> Murray lives um, uh, just outside of Lacombe and has corn grazed for a lot of years. Um, <clears throat> my initial um, um, corn grazing occurred um, Believe it or not, in 1972, when my father decided that he was going to grow grain corn, and um, this was in western Manitoba, and he tried to grow corn that was about 2,300 corn heat units in a 2,100 corn heat unit area. He had all the equipment because we did a lot of row cropping, uh, and... Um, Along comes September and the kernels just weren't going to mature. So um, the fall went on, all the other crops were harvested and cows were weaned and he was feeding hay. And one day he decided, well, I'm just gonna open the gate because this corn's just standing here. And to his surprise, the cows went out into the field, stayed there a lot. Uh, he was uh, marveled at how great the condition of the corn cows were. And um, the only thing he did wrong was not continue to corn graze. <clears throat> so we've been working on uh, winter grazing uh, since the mid 1990s at Lacombe. And I'm gonna talk about um, some corn grazing and swath grazing. We've done both uh, in order to give you all the information you need. I'm gonna have to talk a little bit about swath grazing as well as corn grazing. Uh, we began grazing corn in 2008 at Lacombe and um, off and on we continue to do so and have grown corn uh, most recently and almost all producers and our um, cow herd at Lacombe graze standing corn uh, from uh, time to time. So this is a slide of cows grazing standing corn at Lacombe. And um, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, residue is important. And just to give you an idea of um, what the corn looks like as cows go into it uh, here, um, and um, then they're left in the field until they clean up about this much, um, as you see on my right-hand side. First of all, I think one of the reasons um, we have many environmental reasons why we might do um, um, fall grazing or winter grazing, and we're going to talk about those uh, for most of the talk. But the reason uh, that we got interested in looking at uh, fall and winter grazing uh, was to uh, reduce the cost of overwintering uh, beef cows. So. In order to do this, we look at the daily total cost per cow, and that can be divided up into the feed cost or the cost that's required to grow the crop. Uh, so this is really important for corn. And on the um, left-hand side of the screen, it says feed production by cost. Um, and this is the cost from planting until uh, we would harvest it, harvest the crop if it was a control or um, just leave it in the swath for swath grazing or turn cows and into it. And so um, <clears throat> the feed cost is reduced because we're not harvesting. Uh, and you can see from the control on the right uh, that the largest costs involved are uh, with control or conventional feeding is with the cost of operating equipment and fuel. For the small grain crops, um, they, uh, particularly in barley, uh, cost about the same um, in terms of seed cost and so on, um, but corn uh, costs more to grow per acre or per hectare, and for that reason we have to have high yields. Yardage is the other cost that we think about when we're talking about um, um, overwintering uh, livestock or operating feedlots. And it's a constant cost. Uh, the yardage cost of um, 
uh, grazing corn, uh, standing corn in the fall will be much, much cheaper uh, than it would be at a feeding site or with harvested, um, harvested forage. Um, the yield of the corn is not quite as important to yardage, uh, but it does allow, if the yield is high, it does allow more cows to be serviced uh, per acre or per unit of production uh, than you would if it was a fewer number of cows. <clears throat> so I'm going to use uh, Manitoba Agriculture projected costs for 2024 because they do a really nice job of um, um, putting together projected costs and spreadsheets for the beef industry. Uh, they're part of the um, cow-calf network across Canada, and um, most provinces uh, use a similar system. But this allows us, and there, this allows us to compare different um, systems, and um, they are projecting for Manitoba costs. Um, other provinces do something similar, but to give you an example, owned summer pasture or pasture that's owned by the producer is about a dollar 18 and they uh, proportion out about 135 days you may be longer than that uh, extended grazing in their case is 35 days and i will say that um, when we first started doing work on winter grazing uh, we assumed that you had to have at least 60 days um, and about 150 uh, cow days per acre uh, to be able to um, justify moving into it, and we've by far surpassed that. Most important thing here, though, is the <clears throat> normal winter seeding co feeding costs uh, for 2024. Uh, the feed cost itself was 232. That's with conserved feed, assumed to be 195 days, and yardage in this case is about a dollar 84. So it's about three times as much as the yardage would be for um, uh, winter grazing corn. So a reference point here is the total winter feeding cost of um, conventional feeding of over four dollars. And if you had to do that for 195 days uh, for 100 cows, that would be $81,000. We often use the number 100 cows for 100 days, and that would cost you $41,000. So in the next slide, we'll see what the possible savings would be. So in the Manitoba cost system, and these are for yields for Manitoba corn, which uh, we'll talk about next, but that's about seven and a half imperial tons of dry matter per acre would be about $1.28. And their cost for barley swath grazing $1.43 with relatively low yields of barley. Stockpiled grass is less than that, $1.19. And cereal residue cleanup, quite popular in parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan, about 92 cents. As we go down the uh, column here, it takes more acres um, to um, last 100 cows for 100 days than it does for corn grazing, or perhaps triticale in central Alberta. So the final slide that I'll show on cost uh, has to do with corn grazing in Manitoba uh, versus uh, swath grazing barley, and you can see the difference uh, per acre for corn grazing, uh, close to $500. Uh, and interestingly enough, this was about the cost of corn grazing for Murray Abel uh, in about 2017. Uh, seed cost and fertilizer costs are uh, the largest difference. Uh, particularly seed cost uh, is gonna be about three times more than um, the uh, small grains and um, the amount of fertilizer depends on where you are, and we'll talk about how that may be able to be decreased um, later. So these costs are based on about seven and a half tons of uh, dry matter, um, imperial corn, 15 tons wet, and uh, four and a half tons of um, barley uh, per acre. And this gives you the feed costs I showed later. 
I'll add to this about another 60 cents in both cases of yardage, and it gets you up to a dollar eighty, a dollar eighty eight, and two dollars um, for barley, dollar eighty eight for corn. So the savings with yardage included for 100 cows for 100 days would be <clears throat> about um, $22,000 or $20,000. Again, quite similar to uh, estimates by Murray Abel, uh, the farmer outside of Lacombe. However, we can't always guarantee ourselves to have these uh, yields uh, that are projected. And if we lower corn to six tons and increase barley to six tons, uh, then the amount saved uh, would be higher with the barley than the corn. And this sometimes happens in short season areas. So we're talking about yield being important and uh, yield drives carrying capacity or the number of cow days per acre uh, and high carrying capacity results in low daily cost and more savings. So it's important to corn because corn costs more than some other crops to grow. So where were we in terms of corn uh, yield relative to other crops in this short season area at Lacombe? Uh, in this trial over four years, we didn't make seven and a half tons of dry matter per acre, but we did uh, get over six and averaged uh, higher yields in triticale, barley and oat. Uh, but there is variation and triticale can yield as much as corn when, in years when it's uh, dry and cold. If we calculate this through to carrying capacity or cow days per acre, uh, corn still is on top because it's higher yielding. Um, and um, triticale and barley come up a little bit, uh, but corn was still on uh, the top. The daily feed costs worked out to be fairly close to what uh, the Manitoba projections were as well. Um, corn still costing a bit more than um, triticale and barley, um, but still a substantial savings uh, compared to the uh, $2 or $1.80 a day for conserved feed. So now I'm going to move into <clears throat> Uh, more specifically talking about um, winter grazing and winter corn grazing. And this is something that our producer panel may want to address about how they graze uh, corn, uh, because it may have some implications on nutrient losses and gains uh, um, throughout the winter and in the spring. But most people and ourselves at Lacombe Research Station uh, have to graze corn in this way. We, a certain amount of corn is allocated to um, cattle for a certain number of days, uh, and the cows move back and forth between a bedding and shelter uh, and the corn. And so this builds up gradients or more nutrients or manure in some areas of the, of the pasture than others. And when we get snow and cows graze on snow, um, as we go throughout the winter, uh, we tend to get these thin snow packs of ice and manure. Below the ground, not much is going on in December and January uh, on the prairies if you're grazing then, and many people are starting to graze early, so it may not be at that time. There may be ways to avoid this. The next few slides will talk about carbon sequestration and diesel fuel um, uh, reduction and how corn grazing may help to reduce um, or, or to increase carbon sequestration and reduce uh, diesel fuel use. And this has to do with reducing the carbon dioxide equivalents for greenhouse gas emissions. So this field is Murray Abel's field uh, and gives you an idea of some manure here in the bottom, which you producers know all about. And then Murray felt that he was leaving about 25% of the crop he grew as residue. And we assume that we're utilizing about 80%, so leaving about 20%. So it's really hard 
to tell you on your particular farm and field how much carbon you could sequester. And so it depends on what you want to compare to. So I just made up this fictitious, fictitious example of what could happen. And this would be a producer or myself converting from a, a silage-based system to a corn graze system. And so we have about the same yield and the amount of yield is really important because this is your net productivity above ground uh, that's produced through photosynthesis and how you capture carbon. In the silage and grazing system, we have export off the, off the field versus what is retained on the field of that, say 14 and a half kilogram per hectare crop or about a seven kilogram, a uh, seven uh, ton crop per acre. So 90% of the silage may be re reduced uh, if we graze, uh, utilize 80% uh, for the um, uh, 80 for the corn graze and about uh, 68 to 70% is digestible, then we export uh, a quantity less than we would have for corn silage. <clears throat> so then we retain on the field only about 10% of what we produce in residue for the silage, uh, but we have uh, residue, root, and manure that's retained on the uh, surface and below ground uh, uh, for the, um, uh, the grazed corn. We have a little bit of soil respiration, which I'm assumed to be the same, um, but um, in the end, the amount sequestered is much smaller than what we produce. But let's take a look at where that takes us. If we're looking at the amount of organic matter, which is what we're producing above ground with the grazed crop, uh, we're sequestering about close to 600 kilograms per hectare, 600 pounds per acre. Breaking that down to carbon, it's around 204. So that's a little bit more than the average um, average zero till uh, uh, conversion from conventional tillage to zero till. Uh, so that would be, if we could all do that, uh, we'd be doing just a little bit better uh, than zero till here. The greenhouse gas equivalent of that, which is what we, uh, what we offset from other greenhouse gas productions is also uh, in a positive direction, uh, close to 500 uh, kilograms per hectare. One thing that's a slam dunk in saving greenhouse gas emission uh, with uh, extended grazing is the reduced amount of diesel fuel and um, um, carbon dioxide or energy related uh, to the building of equipment and inputs into that system, including fertilizer. And in this example, we're looking at corn that we swath grazed, but it could be standing. And we look at the crop production side, we save a little bit per cow day in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission of carbon dioxide. In terms of feeding, <clears throat> which is the yardage part, we save a tremendous amount, about four one quarter, we use about one quarter the amount as we do with conventional. So this is a slam dunk. When we multiply this up on the same uh, carrying capacity, we're saving, um, we're saving about, again, about 500 um, kilograms of carbon dioxide per hectare that can be used to offset other emissions. Let's look at forage quality because we want to know uh, where we stand in terms of corn, in terms of possible weathering or loss quality during winter. And uh, this is related to enteric methane emission from cattle as well. So a few years ago, I made up this slide where, we're, where I ranked the um, in vitro digestibility of um, a number of swath grazed crops and stockpile grass that included corn uh, with the average weight loss to a 1500 pound cow. And 
we see as the in vitro digestibility increases and we have corn being up near the highest, uh, we lose less cow weight, uh, weight per cow uh, over the, the 100 days or the grazing period. Um, if we looked at um, cows fed in pens, they would be gaining about 70 pounds during this part. And the reason that we're losing weight uh, when we're grazing in the field is because it takes more work for the cow to graze and the conditions are usually more severe. Over the whole winter, um, we looked at the um, quality of uh, a number of different crops. We actually looked at tenderfoot crops and I'm just showing you corn, barley and triticale. And this is the average over three years. And from October to March, the total digestible nutrients of the corn stayed more or less the same. There would be a trend for a slight loss. But with barley and triticale, there was a, a linear decline in quality throughout the winter. From a protein point of view, um, the corn is uh, much lower than barley or triticale. This is not a problem um, in the fall if your calving is in March, but as you get towards uh, February and March, it's probably a bit low and some protein might have to be supplemented. Where do we sit in terms of uh, methane emission? Because I, I said that perhaps corn has a role here in reducing methane emission. Um, and there are no rules that we give anybody to do, but um, reducing methane emission, um, one of the cardinal rules would be to feed only as much as the animals need, because the more they eat, the more methane is produced. And in addition, what they eat uh, is low in fiber as you can afford. Um, so one kilogram of um, in global, global warming potential of methane is equal to about 28 kilograms of carbon dioxide that we talked before talked about before. So we we looked at the amount of methane that was produced per day by uh, cows grazing corn and swaths uh, versus cows grazing triticale. And we did this in cooperation with Dr. Tom Flesch from the University of uh, Alberta. And he used laser techniques on either side of the swaths uh, to measure the amount of output of methane in each case. Uh, we used a conventional laser method uh, and we also used something called Fourier transformed infrared. Um, we, looked at, we looked at methane um, in, in separate swaths like this uh, with triticale and corn. And um, we allocated about enough feed for four days. And what we found, of course, was that the cows ate most of the feed in the first day, uh, but they consumed more corn uh, than they did um, triticale. In vitro digestibility decreased in both cases, but decreased more with corn over the four days. And we saw that starch declined rapidly. It was almost all gone after the first day and people who graze corn know uh, that the cows go after the grain first. In terms of methane emission, uh, two of the four days, um, we had um, more emission from the triticale than the corn and about the same in the other days, uh, but we had uh, less methane overall from the corn. So I'll quickly, I'm going to go over an important part and that is perhaps in the spring, we have a hot spot created for nitrous oxide emission on corn crops. And I'm not gonna to talk too much more because we're getting out of time. Uh, but the fact is, is that what we have in the spring is a, a thawing out of the, the soil and the ice and the manure on top. Uh, and in warm days, we get nitrous oxide emitted because our, our moisture content is high. So nitrogen applied to, in roots, residues, fertilizer, and manure um, contribute to N2O emission, and most of that occurs in the spring. So questions we have to ask are, can we reduce the amount of fertilizer N we use for corn grazed and um, 
could we go to crop rotation, uh, keeping our use of land um, lower? Um, in other words, fewer years, year after year. I'm going to move through these to show you some of the information, but we compared uh, a field site in the spring that had been uh, grazed uh, versus a feeding site. We see here with green, the temperature was- Can you um, call Mike and see what he wants? I'm sorry, I had some feedback there, but um, the um, when the temperature was um, uh, below zero, uh, we had no emission. When temperature above zero, we had a lot of nitrous oxide that you can see in blue. When we compare the feeding site with the winter grazing site, we had significantly more nitrous oxide produced and relatively high amounts. So we had over five kilograms of N2ON per hectare and in a barley field uh, in central Alberta, you might have two. So we have nutrient patterns that we create during winter grazing and they increase over seasons and over years and they're due to the way that the cattle graze on the corn in the winter. The actual amount that we um, <clears throat> that we turn over or may, may uh, have on these fields in each year is shown in this slide from 2012. The amounts that go into the field by over a period of years may be relatively small for fertilizer root and residue, but we turn over a lot of nitrogen in manure and this accumulates over the years. So this is my getting that to my last slide and it's kind of um, what do we do about that? Um, and there are a number of things we can do and it may be different on each farm, but if we look at the amount of fertilizer nitrogen that we applied to these stands of winter grazing uh, from about 2008 until now, uh, we started off with 100 and ended up with nothing. So what we could have done since we were taking up um, about 200 um, uh, pounds of nitrogen um, uh, per acre into the crop uh, and um, and um, excreting or manure going on at over 150 pounds or uh, close to 100 pounds, then um, perhaps uh, we don't need as much fertilizer. The problem is, is at what point in time do we stop using fertilizer? The other thing is, is that perhaps we should only be uh, winter grazing for a couple of years, accumulating those nutrients and then harvesting them uh, with other crops to follow in crop rotation. Um, so I think I should stop here or I can talk about this last slide to summarize it up. It just depends on how much time we have left. Um, basically, um, <clears throat> things look quite promising for grazing uh, corn. We had um, a reduction um, in um, uh, carbon dioxide or energy uh, emissions uh, due to uh, reduction in diesel fuel while we're feeding. If we move from a conventional system uh, to a fall graze system with corn, we are likely increasing uh, carbon sequestration. If we're using uh, corn uh, relative to other crops for winter grazing, we're likely increasing uh, enteric methane a little bit. And we have some opportunities to manage uh, nitrous oxide through more efficient use of uh, uh, manure and residue on winter grazing uh, in crop rotations uh, uh, to reduce those emissions as well. So thank you very much and um, I'll wait for questions later. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Bear. And that really tied everything together and gave us the picture with the uh, environmental as well as the cost of production. So now we'll move into our rancher panelists.
guests. And first off is Steve Devick of Devick Ranch. They are one of the two uh, ranches that participated as a mother site for the Living Labs project where three to four BMPs are tested. And they took on corn grazing as one of their options. And Wyatt has the, the pictures of the ranch and they'll, Steve, will, he'll take us through. And some of the questions, the two questions that I posed to both um, Steve and Devin were to tell us a bit about your ranch location and why you chose to implement corn grazing and what were some of the things that worked well and what were some of the things that you do differently? And I know they both have a lot of detail about some of the things that uh, went on on their ranch and especially relating to the livestock. Okay, so yeah, um, I'm from uh, or with uh, Devix Ranch here. Uh, we are located in just north of Kamloops, uh, kind of in between Kamloops and Barrier. Um, so I would be the cattle manager of Devix Ranch. Um, so when it comes to corn uh, seed or how much fertilizer they put on or any of that kind of stuff, I, I'm, I wasn't involved with that. I'm not knowledgeable on that. Um, where I'm knowledgeable was and kind of designed our grazing pattern or rotation or how we were going to graze uh, the corn. Um, so this corn, um, it obviously did very well. Um, it was anywhere from eight to nine feet tall um, in good soil production areas. Um, the corn grew at about 3,000 feet elevation. Um, so we aren't, yeah, we're fairly high. So it did well for the elevation that we were at. Um, water side of things. Um, we like for cattle watering, um, we installed two water troughs um, to service the cattle um, because in past um, situations, we uh, realized that clean, clear water and availability to that will um, increase uh, food consumption by about 20%, which then leads to condition on cattle, which is which is even better for every, everything, uh, for keeping pounds on cattle. Um, fencing wise, how we fenced this, you can see um, we had irrigated this corn with um, real guns. Um, so I, every every section that we had, we had five sections. Um, one was a little bit smaller, just the way the uh, field laid out. Um, but so four big sections uh, that were about five acres um, and then one section that was, I don't know, we'll call it 0.2 acres because I think it's 20 or it'd be two acres because uh, I think we were on 20 acres of, uh, of corn is what we did. Um, yeah, there you go. That's perfect timing. Um, so what we had, we had 20, we had 44 acres that we were working on. Um, the 22 acres to the north was, was a forage pro. Um, and that, that was a, that was a big mix. I'm not going to even come to close to what all that was in that. Um, like I say, I wasn't knowledgeable on that part. Um, but the, we, what the plan was, was to uh, have the Forge Pro as a fall graze and then the corn as a winter graze. Um, and the what we did was we put the cattle in the Forge Pro, which would be the 22 acres. Um, we predicted that it was going to last us five days. Um, and this would be on 304 head um, that we put in to this program um, and the kind of cattle that we put on this program and just with availability of cattle and um, and rotations and where cattle need to be um, I ended up putting our heifers and heiferettes in on this program uh, with a little bit of resistance from the older generation on whether that was the right cattle to put in because they, as we all know, are the most sensitive um, types of cattle to, or age 
age group to keep condition on for breed back and um, and weaning weights and and just condition scores in general. Um, so and with a remark on that, um, these cattle did amazingly um, and and the older generation was very proud on the um, condition that the cattle came out of this program on. So, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was a big win. Um, so the uh, Forge Pro lasted us three days. Um, and so I was not necessarily willing to, uh, as this being our first year, willing to put all our eggs in one basket and, and leave our condition of our cattle at risk just to see how things worked. Um, so we kind of did a, a hybrid um, program on the feeding and grazing. Um, so what we did is we fed, we got through the forage pros, they licked that up in, in three days. We started feeding um, the cattle. We fed for about six days um, and to make sure that they were cleaned right up. And I wanted to find out where our full feed value was where where these cattle were going to be when they had nothing to eat um, and they were relying strictly on our our uh, the bales that we were putting out for them um, so then on um, we opened or on November 20th we did a full feed um, on these cattle and um, we're going to call that I'm going to call it about eight eight bales on them um, was full feed. And uh, once the full feed was put out and they had eaten and they had started to water, that is when we took the fence down into the first two acres. Um, so then they, then in the afternoon, went into the corn on full bellies, which um, was recommended to us uh, so that they don't overload on starches and corn and uh, just get too high of a value on it. Uh, the first section was very slow because the cattle had never seen it. And um, there's a bit of a learning curve on the cattle side of it to, to know how that was, what, what to do with it. Basically, they had no clue. Um, so we ended up the first section, uh, we fed basically uh, half feed um throughout the whole thing and until about the uh fourth day and uh fourth fifth sixth day we gradually got back up into uh full full feed on on the fifth day i think because it was a small small section um so then once we were back up to full feed then we opened the fence into the second section um which then um, then they all went into uh, because they knew what what things were about. Um, and once again, we fed a full feed and then opened up after their bellies were full so they didn't go in and gorge on corn. Um, and then once the cows knew what was going on, um, we found that we were two days on no feed and then on the third day we'd feed about a quarter feed fourth day half feed third or fifth uh about it yeah it, however that all lined out it worked to be about we were back on full feed in seven days and um on the seventh day we'd open up into the next section and and then we'd go two days no feeding and then gradually work them back in um but the reason for that is because we weren't willing to, um, or we didn't know what the uh, end result was gonna be. And we wanted to make sure that our cattle stayed in good condition throughout the whole thing. Um, and I would say for cattle expectations or for ranchers expectations, the first day they basically go in there and knock it all down. Uh, second day, they flatten it completely. Um, third day and fourth day they pretty much utilized everything and licked up everything that they want and what they want is the tops of the stalks the cobs the husks 
and the leaves. Um, we found what was left was uh, the bottom half, I would say, of the coarse dried out stalks, um, which I would say in the earlier there, the estimation of 25% left, which would be that. Um, that might actually, that picture there is, would be what it looked like on the second day. Um, they utilized it a lot more than that, but the, the first day, like I say, they just go in and knock it down. This is what it looks like on the second day. Um, but then they're all, they lick that up to, um, look a lot better than that. That, uh, that's not, not the end, end result by any means. Um. So it took us um, a total of about uh, 37 days to get through the whole uh, 20, 22 acres, I guess. Um, and, and we were relatively happy. Um, I guess uh, some of my concerns on it, on the rancher side of it was um, the shrinkage from uh, harvest time to um, grazing time. Um, that corn, like you saw in that picture, was anywhere from eight to nine feet. Um, and at harvest time, it had shrunk significantly to about five to five, I'd say five feet. Um, so I haven't seen the numbers on that part of it. Um, but that, that would be one of my concerns. And then the uh, waste obviously for us it's a little bit more of a concern in bc because our uh, cultivated land is very limited um, so every acre is very valuable so we do have to do a little more number crunching with the university to see their results on forage weight uh, residual and um, and utilization on that for sure um, and uh things I would change. I think I, uh, seeing the results from the cattle, I don't think I would change anything. Um, for our operation, um, we, it'd be pretty tough for us to not to start the tractor. Um, so we're feeding anyway. Um, but in that saying that, um, it did take our feeding time from about three hours on the cow herd well, when they were on corn, um, it brought it down about an hour just because of the location and tractor uh, travel on the road and, and all that stuff. So um, there is definitely a benefit to that. Um, things that I yeah would change would uh, fencing uh, the little that's uh, make sure that that's uh, lined out. We had a little bit of issues with the little uh, rope, electric rope fencing. Um, I think a uh, couple of things was if you, we got a big snowfall, it kind of sagged down um, in uh, and touched the ground and grounded out a little bit. Um, and also when you have 300 uh, cows in um, a relatively, I'm going to call that a relatively confined area um, for that many cows, they do put quite a bit of pressure on it. So uh, just to make sure that you have good control on them, I might switch that to a little bit of a a stronger fencing, like high tensile or or um, something like that. So next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Devin Tristanoff from PV Ranch, and he's one of the Cattle and Forage Living Lab. He's looking to be on part of the daughter sites, which uh, they undertake one to two BMPs, and uh, he also uh, went in and did some corn grazing so i'll turn it over to you devon and we put in five five of your 14 pictures you provided which we sure appreciate and uh, we'll just move those along so please go ahead thanks karen yeah so we're located just uh 30 kilometers north of grand fork we're just right on the u.s border here um this particular property um, that we decided to do the corn grazing on is actually 13 kilometers away from kind of our home ranch and where we live. Um, and so one of the reasons we decided to do corn grazing uh, trial it uh, was we just wanted to try find a way to feed our cows without having to drive uh, up to them every day um, once they're on feed for the winter. 
And so you can see this field here is a 40 acre pivot. Um, and so we put 20 acres into corn production this past year. Uh, we utilized a 2450 heat unit, um, working with our seed provider, just trying to get something that wasn't going to be super mature. Um, and so that seemed to be um, another thing we tried, uh, Vern, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this, uh, was we planted some of it at a 42,000 population. Um, the idea being maybe to keep a smaller stem on that corn, um, have more plants, uh, more leaf and, and more cobs, but maybe smaller and, and see what cows utilize on that versus a big, big thick stock. Um, so what we found is that we were able to do uh, two acre moves on them and that lasted every three days. Um, so every three days we would go and we would just take the old tractor that you see there, we'd drive through the corn, make a new line. And we'd also put out six uh, hay bales that we took off of the north 20 acres there that you can see in the background. Um, and so very much like Steve, um, we did a, a, you know kind of a similar situation where we would put six hay bale, round bales out for those cows and then we would open the fence. Um, they seemed to like the hay pretty good and then they'd come into the corn and, and again just to try balance their, their stomachs on that first day so that they didn't go and just cob hunt for the first day because um, once they get a taste room, they definitely will do that. Um, so we ended up getting 37 days as well, actually, um, on 230 dry cows um, and heifers. Um, and so, you know, and one thing we really did like was uh, every three days, uh, you know, my wife and I, it would take us an hour. We could put out those bales. We could move that fence. Um, yeah, cleaning up the electric, putting the new one out. And so time-wise, it was really nice for us. Um, but it wasn't a big labor load every um, every day. It was just every three days. So uh, for the fall time, and same thing with any sort of um, like wet, heavy snow that you see here. I think this picture would be, we went up on October the 28th. And so this is sometime early November. Um, and so just this wet, heavy snow, that corn sure does stand up pretty nice. Um, and it just stays up out of the snow. One of our big concerns is, is we did have a really wet fall. And so I'm, I'm curious to see this next coming year, what the weather's gonna be like, how much got trampled and how much those cows, uh, again, like Steve pointed out in that first, second day, they do trample a lot. And, uh, and some of this first stuff here um, was pretty muddy. Uh, and, and in fact, we, we had the idea of maybe trying to feed our hay out on the, the paddock before, um, just to try and feed the cows on that residue and see if we could help break it down for the next spring. Um, but it was just so muddy, we decided that we would feed that hay out on that hayland. Um, and so you can see here with that heavy snow, we did, uh, you know, a lot of our corn did bend over, but the, the standability on it was really good. I was really happy with it. All those cobs stayed standing. Um, yeah, and so I, one of my uh, one of my other concerns, I guess, um, you know, it lasted us 37 days. So we were into December the fourth. Um, you know, if we were our 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 hope this year is to do that whole 40 acres into corn, um, and and one of our thoughts is if we are pushing those cows further into their gestation period, uh, do we have the nutrients there? Um, those bales that were um, were produced up on this field were easy in there. And do I want to be hauling bales or do I go to some sort of a mineral tub, protein tub, um, just to balance that ration on those cows? Uh, that'll be something for us for sure this year. You know, if we're going to be able to get 60 days of grazing on a similar sized herd, um, then that's something we're going to kind of be concerned about going into early January. Um, and then just uh, the residue. Um, that'll be really interesting to see this year what uh, what the residue management is going to be like this spring. Um, you know, especially on some of this first stuff, this early stuff where it was wet and we probably didn't get as good a utilization as some of our further stuff along. Um, it'll be interesting to see as we want to try and plant corn back into that same ground. Um, and so this is kind of a picture you can see. Uh, it's a bit of a pano, so it's a little distorted, but this is from the center point of the pivot. And so we would we would pie it off. Um, and so, you know, you can see these cows 
all that residue and, and on the left hand side you can see where they've been walking quite a bit um, and and we did try and you know another residue management thing that we definitely noticed was where we were moving our our uh, mineral tub um, or we were where we were trying to have water access um, anything that they can do to be walking that corn into the ground once they're done in that area I think is going to help us out this spring um, this this particular property where we decide to do it is actually an off-grid site. And so in terms of all-season water, that's going to be another challenge for us. Um, wanting to try to push that season. This year was a pretty warm fall and we didn't have much issue with any freezing water. Uh, we were able to um, run a pipe off of a creek and, and that this year uh, was good. In other years, it hasn't been. And so that'll for sure be one one thing that's going to be a challenge for us. Uh, you know, if, if with this 40 acres and wanting to try hit January with corn grazing, um, is that water availability for those cows. Um, and that's about it. Great, that was that was fantastic. Yeah, lots of great, great detail. And thanks, thanks so much for that, Devin, and sharing that with us. And I'll just turn it over to Tanya Brewers, a researcher from Thompson Rivers University that did research on the Devic Ranch and for her insights um, and what she'd recommend as uh, you're going through um, implementing the corn grazing, grazing both in pre-planning and implementation. And then what would be one of her key takeaways for folks that are considering this from her perspective? Yeah, hi. Um... In terms of pre-planning, we were basically following the lead of the Devix. They really were excited to try the corn. And from my perspective, that's fantastic because um, now I get to look at how that's impacting uh, carbon sequestration. I'm very um, excited to be seeing what's going to be happening in the spring here with the residue, uh, the nutrient cycling, et cetera. Um, I would agree with Steve. We were challenged with the fencing a little bit. Um, and I think that might be just more because um, we sort of took that on as the researchers and we're not really close enough to the property. So um, there was a bit, you know, a few things to iron out in that department for sure. Um, but overall, we were extremely happy with what we saw, um, particularly with the utilization. I know that when the cattle initially went in, everybody was a little bit alarmed, thinking that perhaps it wasn't being utilized enough. But um, after talking with other researchers, and obviously Steve is sounding very positive, we were very happy with the utilization on the ground. Um, from our end, we're providing the DEVIX with the yield results. Um, I've provided that as a silage um, equivalent. And then with the spring coming up, I'm gonna head in there and take residue samples so I can also let them know what the intake was. So that should be quite interesting and will help them going forward with um, how they're gonna plan their crop. Um, yeah, in terms of takeaway uh, for other ranchers, I mean, working with researchers, maybe you don't let them do the fencing. <laughs> um, other, than, other than that, um, I think the takeaway just might be, you know, talk to other ranchers just so you get a sense of, you know, if it's the first time out, what should that look like on the ground when the cattle have gone through? Because if, you know, a first time goer, it might be a little strange to see how much is left over. But other than that, for from my end as a researcher, it's been really great. Um, I'm super excited to get the results in the spring with intake and nutrients. Super. Thanks so much, Tanya. Well, that brings everything to a close. We sure appreciate the participation and our speakers uh, here today. Thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, it's really been super helpful to hear all the detailed information. We'd ask you to join us uh, next week where we also will be talking about cover crops and we'll have Dr. Jillian Bernard and also rancher panelists that'll share the, the details about what works well and not so well and help in the implementation. So thanks very much. Before we close things out, I just wanted to say if anyone has any questions, uh, please uh, email us. Uh, livinglabs at bcforagecouncil.com is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me so that we can relay it to our, our panelists here. Uh, it was great to have all of our panelists. I want to especially thank Byrne, Devin, 
Steve and Tanya for, for saying a few words. I think it's nice that we get to tackle it from all these different angles. So that's one of the big perks of this Living Labs project is we get these different perspectives, whether it's economics, carbon, and just pure nutrition. It's, it's, it's great to get all these perspectives. So thank you so much. And we'll see you all next, next week. Thank you.